So let's start with uh, this talk about um, legal compliance. I mean, I didn't wrote the entire title because it was too long, but anyway, that's, that's what we will be speaking about now. A quick introduction about myself. So you might find me easily looking for my nickname, uh, TTYNE, um, on most platforms. I have 25 years of experience uh, with open source. I started at the time of Unix, <laughs> see, see the move of to Windows again and Linux again and so on. I'm one of the co-founders of Ubuntu Studio. Um, French speaking people might know Framasoft, so I moderated the forum a couple of years. Uh, I work at the Eclipse Foundation. I know I'm working at Highland where I'm basically in charge of developer relations and uh, tech communities. And what I try to do for tech people, because I'm not tech myself, uh, it's to uh, work on useful content, useful uh, tips and tricks and so on uh, to, to help developers be better with best practices and, uh, and stuff like that. That's how I came to prepare this talk uh, about legal compliance. So today, <coughs> uh, I will explain what's the difference between risk management and legal compliance, okay, and why it's a topic that is usually ignored by uh, tech people and developers. We will see um, an easy use case. I mean, not so easy, that's the point. Um, with containers, um, a typical example is with Docker containers, okay? Then we will speak a bit about open source licenses, so three main families, and a bonus. I mean, everybody knows is starting to try to integrate uh, LLM and artificial intelligence into uh, what they distribute to their customers. So uh, there's a lot of new licenses, actually. Most of them are not open source. So uh, we'll speak about what you can do, what you cannot do, what you must not do. And uh, at the end, because actually tech people uh, can help, OK? Uh, we'll speak about tools and solutions and policies you can uh, put in place uh, to, to help actually your software to be compliant. That's, that's the key. So risk management and legal compliance. There's two things. Who knows security in terms of risk management? Please raise your hand. I think it's obvious, most of you. You have patches, you have CVEs, all these kind of things, okay? But I guess maybe less people know the risk part of legal compliance, okay? So when you ship software, and nowadays, uh, we will send the next slide, most software is a combination between open source software and proprietary software. This is what we do. Everybody here at the conference, we do that. Uh, you have to respect the entire chain of licenses of what you ship with uh, dependencies, libraries, and dependencies of dependencies of dependencies. And this can be tricky, particularly with open source licenses, okay? So this is part of IP management, intellectual property management, and copyright, and so on. And this is often an underestimated risk type. But for example, if you work with a small company, you don't care. If you work with governments, with large enterprise and so on, they will care more about legal compliance than about security. Because security, it's easy to hire an expert to patch something. Legal compliance, if you screw something, you have to replace entire part of your software, an entire library, if this is a wrong license. And it can be tricky and take really more time than just applying a patch and test again. So why I feel that, I mean, Let's face it, most tech people I know, they don't care about legal compliance. They don't understand it. And there is a reason for that. Is that you can study IT, computer science, software development engineering during five years or doing a PhD about that. And not having one day of training about intellectual property management. But when you write code, you became an author, okay? And being an author, copyright to play. That's why there are open source licenses or, I mean, copyright contracts and stuff like that. Because what you write, I mean, there is copyright on it. So this is not for tech people because, I mean, you don't have the knowledge, okay? But we will need tech people to fix problems. 
Because at one point, if we have to replace parts of the code or library, I mean, you need to be skilled to be able to do it. A legal people or a product manager cannot do that without tech people. But what can we do? People like me, I don't code. I'm not a tech guy. Okay, I work with tech guys, but I don't. I don't write Java and so on. We can write documentation. At least, let's say we can say this license. It is not possible to use it. It's blacklisted. Okay, this license. It's okay. And then in your contributor guideline, if you're doing open source, or in your internal developer documentation, if you're not doing open source, you can put that into the documentation and create awareness to start to foster best practices. And of course, I mean, it's so easy. You go on NPM, you see that it does a job. You don't mind about the license. And you start to write, you ship, and at one point, months later, some guys came and say, hey, hey, you don't have the right to use this one. What do you do? So we can avoid that by documenting and, and giving information, the right information and tooling to the developers. This is what we will see uh, in this presentation. <coughs> so one important point is that open source licenses apply when you distribute the software. So let's say you get some software for inside use, you run it for your company, you're not distributing it. So I won't say that you can do whatever you want, you still need to be careful, but you have a kind of freedom around that because you're not shipping, you're not distributing the software. But when what you develop goes to the customer or to an integrator and so on, all the chain of distribution actually, the software redistributor is responsible for to, to be sure that it is legal compliance. So you have to check the open source licenses and copyright contracts and ensure that it's okay for the end user to, to have it and run it, okay? As an integrator, there's a lot of integrator and uh, service companies here. You are redistributing software. Each time you install something on customer premises, on public cloud, you are redistributing because it goes outside of your company. So you're responsible. And I said it, most of our nowadays, it's a combination of open source libraries and dependencies and components and the proprietary code you write to put it together and make it to work, okay? But it's not just about container. It's not a new problem. In the past, we would, I mean, um, put a firmware, and it's still today, into an embedded device, okay? Uh, it's a package for your Linux distribution, a deb file, an RPM file, it's a zip file uh, with, I mean, a .sh and plenty of files. And of course, no, we ship a lot using containers like Docker images. This is, I would say, exactly the example I want to use, but keep in mind, for those of you who write Java, and I met a lot of people uh, who write Java, we used to use Maven to manage dependencies. Docker is just the next level where you just don't use Java stuff, but a lot of stuff. But it's exactly the same. So the best practices with containers apply with, in general, dependency managers. Okay. So two main uh, use cases. The first one is package software, and I will use the example of a Docker image. Okay. And the second one will be build instructions. So and I will use the example of a Docker image file. Who knows the difference between the two? Please raise your hand so I can adapt. Only one people know the difference, two people, three people. Okay, half the room knows the difference, but some people don't know, so we will see what it means. Use case one, package software into a Docker image. Okay, so what it is, um, it contains one or more software that are built in, okay? So it's a kind of archive that you ship, distribute, and people will actually run it with Docker. It can have many different licenses into one Docker. And this is becoming particularly difficult when you have many layers into your Docker because you, you say, I want Postgre, I want Alfresco, I want something. And all that will come with your own dependencies. And when it's built, I mean, you might not see everything. So you have to check the dependencies of the dependencies. I will see at the end what kind of tooling we can do with that, but you have to be careful. And again, when you put your Docker image into the Docker Hub or Red Hat K or this kind of service, you must ensure it is legally compliant. So it have a few drawbacks. So first, my advice is 
use it for simple images. Typically, for the PostgreSQL Docker image, there's PostgreSQL. It's easy, there is one license, okay? For internal use, when you don't ship, you can build complex Docker images because you will not ship them, so it's okay. So again, keep in mind, it's about distributing. Um, so you must be very careful when you redistribute that. So the point here is that you build one, once, sorry, and every people who will use your Docker image will have the same exact version of everything you prepared in this Docker image. So now, there is a second use case. Let's say what you want to ship has incompatible licenses, like some GPL stuff with proprietary stuff, with MIT stuff, with I don't know what, okay? You cannot build and ship a Docker image. <laughs> you would not be legal compliant, particularly GPL plus proprietary. So the advantage here of the image file is that it's just a list, like a pom.xml with Maven, let's say. It contains no software at all. So you're not distributing software, you're distributing a building instruction, okay? It's always legal compliance. So when you have to ship complex uh, stack of stuff, this is the way to use, okay? And actually, in terms of legal compliance, we consider it will be used by the end user. And it will be built by the end users, and you will download with Docker on the end user premise, okay? So that's the trick. It has also drawbacks, but there's work wrong. <coughs> the first thing is yes, for complex images. The second thing is, is, like with all dependency manager, you must define each version, each repository, and any requirement to ensure that each time someone is building the image, they got exactly the same result, okay? The second thing, and this is a good advice that applies also for um, when you build a classic Docker container image, archive everything into private repositories. There are services offered by Gfrog, um, GitHub, Red Hat K, I told it, where you can actually get everything, including the dependencies of dependencies and so on, so that when you have to rebuild in six months, most of the time with Docker Hub, the problem is that in six months, the version that you use today uh, to build will, will not be available anymore. So Docker, when you build, will look for the next version, but it's not the same. And if you only have to apply a security patch, let's say, or just upgrade a tiny library, you will not have the same build again. But if you keep everything into private repository, then you update your image file, you change the repository address and you put your private repository. Then each time you build, it's the same build, okay? So I don't say that it's easy, but I mean, it's not complicated. And the second thing is that for legal compliance, uh, when there is some open source software, I will explain it later with better examples, but you have to share the sources. You have to tell that you use the software, okay? You have to provide a list of everything of what you ship and their license. If you do that, I mean, you just make it public and that's fine, okay? So that's the best way to be legal compliant. Even if you build a, a classic Docker image, you will have everything to rebuild it in case you need it. So we will just speak quickly about open source licenses. Don't be afraid. I would say this is, uh, the hardest part of this presentation, but um, open source license typically are just a way uh, to manage intellectual property. It's using the copyright um, law, okay, to do the opposite of the classic all right reserved copyright. It's just tell you that the responsibility is given to the end users, and in exchange of that, the author, the distributor, is relieved from any responsibility. If you look at most open source licenses, there is a paragraph, a section telling you use it at your own risk without any warranty, and if you have a problem, it's you're on your own, okay? That's why also we sell support after that, by the way. That's a, that's a good business model. So the, li the license is a contract 
between actually user distributor and your end users. That explains what you can do and can't do. So some licenses have restrictions. And it manages contribution and modification and redistribution. So that's why open source is a good way to manage collaborative development. Okay. It's not a business model. It, it's a way to work together and handle that we write a collective um, something. It's like you would buy a book written by 10 authors. It's exactly the same. Okay, copyright applies this way. It's just that you have the right to modify and ship a new version. The main families, I won't go into detail, but you have the GPL ecosystems with GPL v2, v3, the AGPL, and so on. They call it strong copyleft. To be honest, I don't like that. It's plain on word with copyright, copyleft. But what it means is that if you use some software in your stack that is in GPL and you ship, everything becomes GPL. So you have to take care that it's compatible with the GPL. Proprietary is not. And for example, Apache license is not compatible with GPL v2, but it's compatible with GPL v3. OK, that's why I put the two licenses. So you have to take care about that. Some people in your company might know that. Uh, and you can find a lot of resources uh, on Google um, to find out about that. So now you have the weak copyleft. What's the difference? A weak copyleft license, by the way, is just telling that um, when you modify your software, your modifications are a derivative and are also in LGPL. This is OK with MPL, CDDL, and CC by ESA, by the way. If you modify, the license doesn't change. But it's weaker because you have the right to put it into a proprietary stack. The best example is what Apple is doing with WebKit for Safari. WebKit has been a fork from KHTML. It's in LGPL. You have the example of the CUPS uh, printing system. It's also maintained by Apple. They are using BSD operating system as a base for Darwin and uh, iOS and macOS. And all that, I mean, if you've take, who taken, took the time to ever read when you have a brand new iPhone or brand new MacBook to read the end user, you know the stuff you scroll, you don't read and you check, okay, I agree. Well, actually, this is it. It tells that it, it has inside a lot of stuff, but at the end, it's proprietary. But it's legal compliant to do that. I will give a few examples about that. Then you have what we call a permissive license. I will start with in the middle MIT and BSD and a derivative called ISC that you will find on NPM. It's what we call academic license. So MIT, who knows what means MIT? It's easy. So a famous university on the east coast of America. So it's Massachusetts Institute of Technologies. BSD, more tricky, famous university on the left side of the USA. Berkeley Software Distribution in California. Uh, why we say it's academic? It's because it, it's, just, it's universities. And when they ship software with those licenses, they really say it's a paragraph telling, we give it to you, we don't care what you do with it, but if you have a problem, it's not our fault. Okay? You're responsible of using it. The good thing is that you can modify, you can ship, you can redistribute, you can do whatever you want. You, the only requirement is that you have to tell that you use it. Apache is a bit different. It's more complex license, giving quite the same opportunity, but it also protects, um, it had protection for uh, the authors, typically the contributors to an open source library, and it avoids a few traps in terms of copyright. <coughs> so it's kind of a better and improved version. CC0, so in this presentation, I'm using um, uh, uh, pictures from Unsplash. If you don't know this website, Look for Unsplash, it's really cool. It means that uh, it's a Creative Commons zero license. It's typically used for artwork where you don't have the source, a picture, an icon, uh, I don't know, a font, okay, for display text. And it means that you have the right to, um, to, to, to publish, to redistribute, and use, even for commercial use. Why the, it has been created is that it's a workaround, like the MIT and the BSD. It's a workaround for countries in which copyright or author rights does not exist. And in those countries, by default, copyright apply. So CC0, MIT, and BSD, and Apache have been written to be sure that everywhere in the world, you can use the software. 
Okay? It's a kind of workaround to the public domain, because public domain does not exist everywhere. And then you have funky licenses, like at the bottom, the do what the fuck public license. It really exists, I've used it. Uh, please don't use it, okay? Don't use this kind of fancy stuff. You can have problems because they are bad written, they are not approved by the OSI or the FSF and stuff like that. Basically, I would say you're safe. You can consider that a license is open source when it's approved by the Free Software Foundation or by the Open Source Initiative. Okay? When they are not listed, don't use it. Um, my good example is that if you find a nice cream on the ground, you will not take it and eat it. Okay? It's the same with software. You don't do that. You take care. Okay? It's not safe. It's exactly that. It's, we are speaking about risk management, but with licenses, but it's, it's a question of safety. So, I will go with two easy examples. We know Spotify. We will use it. Okay. So, I guess again, you didn't know it, but if you go in the preferences and the parameters, you scroll down, 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 you will see something called third party softwares. Okay. And this is typically uh, third party licenses. And this is a list of thousands of libraries that are open source, and you have the description of the of the library, a link to the sources, the license, and other critical legal information, and this is in your I mean in your iPhone, in your laptop uh, when you use it, even on your television for those who have Android TV. So it's the same with iOS or Android. You have this list somewhere in the parameters of all the third-party licenses. This is something you must do as a software developer when you ship software to your customers or partners. Okay, so Spotify is a good example. So now let's try a more tricky example with digital home entertainment. Uh, please close the door. Thank you. So when you have, let's say, a Nintendo Switch or an Apple TV, uh, the software I told it earlier is made with the BSD. Um, software distribution. And so it means that Apple and Nintendo have to tell that they use it and they have to provide the original sources, but they don't have to share their modification and they can include it into a proprietary software, firmware, okay, without, I mean, giving all the details. Uh, Visio, on the other side, chose JPL license, so Linux, typically, and actually they must share their modification because their firmware is in JPL, even including their proprietary code, and they don't want to share. So Software Conservancy filed a complaint against them. And at one point, I mean, we have uh, history, case management, and so on. Software Conservancy will win because licenses applies, and I mean, you can really think about that. So if you work for a big company and doing these kind of things, think again about choosing the right licenses with a use case like that because Visio will have to share their secret. Apple and Nintendo don't, okay? That's really important. Maybe your customers don't want to expose some, some secret code or stuff like that. So this is really important and often underestimated. <coughs> this one is really important. Uh, C3PO is, uh, is really important. Why? If you think about it, what we are building right now is uh, I and LLM is really that. He's an assistant. He can translate. He can have a memory for you. He can do a few things like short missions. This is exactly what Tesla is building with their Android robots. Uh, this is exactly the aim of OpenAI in your smartphone. Um, it helps you. It speaks tons of languages. Uh, including, I don't know if you started to use, who, who started to use chat GPT or other for coding? Okay, raise your hand. Yeah, most of you. So it means that it's not only speaking English or French or Farsi or Japanese for you. It's also helping you to write your code, to improve your code, to learn new technologies that you don't know, because it has a history that all brain cannot store, okay? So, so it's really an assistant that we are building, and C3PO, this is exactly what all those big companies are trying to build right now, with the same limitation. He is stupid. He does mistakes. He is wrong most of the time. But if you order something, he will do it, and he will do it quite well in general. But he will make mistakes anyway. 
So you have to be, I mean, behind him. So now let's say you want, and that's a huge topic at Highland, um, all our customers want us to deliver as soon as possible new features using uh, artificial intelligence to manage documents, uh, extract metadata, do an abstract of uh, a long document. Um, I don't know if we feed um, some document system with a video, extract all the information possible, that, like the text on panels, uh, that like someone speaking, we want that to, to have a transcription and so on, understand all the languages, being able to again do an abstract and eventually do the abstract in many languages so that when you search for information into your knowledge base, you will find the right place and, and what, you, what you want. So there are a tons of, this is ugly, I know. There are a tons of LLMs. So problem we face right now is that, of course, some of them you can run it on a laptop like mine, okay, with like 32 gigabyte of memory. You're quite safe for the first, for, sorry, for the left side, okay, you can run that locally. The right column is starting to be complicated to run that because the amount of just RAM is gigantic. So what is that? Actually, um, it's models that are available in the Olama um, project. Who knows Olama already? One, two, three. So Olama is they just take everything, they put it into a kind of Docker um, way to run that. Um, you can download it, it's available on GitHub, it's available also on the Hugging Face. Who knows Hugging Face already? So Hugging Face is like GitHub, but for LLM models. But it's exactly the same, it's a Git stuff, it just have a different UI and adapted features for, for this kind of things. Particularly the size uh, of the CDN, because it, each time you download a model, uh, usually you download a lot of data. Okay. Uh, so, what we do with that is that people who are writing LLMs and artificial intelligence in general, they don't want famous cloud provider to take their code, run it and make money without giving money back to the developers. That's, I would say, one of the drawbacks we saw with the true open source, that people who really make money out of open source are not the editors, it's the people who host it and run it for you. So they started to write crazy licenses. One of the most famous is, uh, is a fair one, is the meta license, okay? Uh, la, so the LAMA2 community license agreement. Uh, so it's only for fair use. Uh, research and development, commercial use is limited by the number of users, but the rates written, it's not really clear. Uh, so I won't take the risk to, to do that without being sure that you have the right. Uh, Falcon has a custom Falcon license uh, where you don't have the right to do a lot of things except personal use and research and development. Uh, you have the Microsoft Research License for Orca 2. Uh, which one we have? And a few of them, like Mistral, the first Mistral model were in Apache License 2, but know that Microsoft invested a lot into Mistral. They are trying to do the same and they stopped using the Apache License and they brought a new custom non-commercial license. So basically, there are stuff you can do and stuff you cannot do apart from running it onto your laptop or some powerful uh, cloud engine, there's three things, three possibilities. If they use a permissive license, we show, I show a uh, user the permissive license was right colon in my table, uh, MIT, BSD, Apache 2, uh, you can use, you can integrate, you can ship, you can redistribute. So meaning that if you have powerful enough infrastructures, you can build application uh, and ship it to customers and have commercial activities with them. Okay, but as I saw you, I show you, not a lot allow that. Or usually when they allow that, it's a limited model with uh, less capabilities. Okay. Then you have the non-commercial licenses. You can do research, you can study, you can improve and whatever, but you don't have the right to make business out of it. So in this case, you must contact the vendors. But if you're a small company, there's chances that they will ignore you. So in this case, uh, I would go to the last category, what I 
called ready to use is that some big actor will actually negotiate for you a commercial license and they will like an include software um, I mean invoice you for the power you need, the amount of RAM, the amount of hard drive, all the time. So in January and December, we made a couple of webinars and quite demonstration with Alfresco and how we can extract data and build powerful assistant, search assistant, by the way, to retrieve content and work with them. And uh, feeding them with the entire library of um, public domain English books. It's quite huge. Uh, it's in text files, but it's quite huge. Uh, and we run the tests during one month, and after the webinar, we stopped the machines, and we got an invoice for something like four dollars. Okay, so the tech guys they didn't even expense it because I mean it co would cost too much to expand four dollars, and I mean we were just spending it. Anyway, so it can be quite cheap. So I put the example of AWS Bedrock because this is what I know we used for the demonstration we did at Highland with my tech guys. Uh, it's quite powerful. It comes with most of the model I show you in my list. It's different from, um, from the Olama uh, stuff, however, because Amazon takes the time to negotiate stuff for you. But if you use that, you're safe. However, the drawback is that it's on AWS. So do you think all the customers uh, will agree that their data is, I mean, taken outside of their data center, sent to AWS, processed, even encrypted by some models running on AWS premises, and then sent back to you with the metadata abstract and all the stuff you asked the uh, LLM to? In Europe particularly, and if you work for governmental, if you work for healthcare, uh, and so on, I mean, you should not do that. It's forbidden by the EU, EU Commission uh, when it's critical and relative to personal data, health data, and stuff like that. So be very careful. Check again with your customer what you have the right to do with the data. Because all that, I told it, it's an assistant, it's a memory. Uh, it's a translator, uh, it's a resume abstract generator, or whatever you want. It uses your data, okay? But it's, I mean, it depends on the term of use of the cloud company hosting the service. So if their term of use, again, you know the stuff you scroll, you check, you didn't read, and then when you discover there is a problem, you complain, but actually you checked it. Particularly if you are working with an integrating company or government or something, ask your legal compliance or your legal team to read the term of use for you before starting to work. Because at one point someone will forbid you and I mean you can be in trouble for taking the initiative to work with hosted services without checking the licenses of the LLM or the term of use of the hosting uh, service. Okay, so this is really important. So if performance or limitation are not a problem for you, go with a permissive license like the, the early Falcon model in Apache 2, the early Mistral model in Apache 2. We did a complete demo with a Mistral model on a MacBook Pro, so a powerful one with uh, one teraoctet of uh, hard drive and uh, something like 32 or 64 um, gigabyte of RAM. Okay, but it runs. It was quite fast, actually. As a, the M1 and M2 stuff are, have a very powerful bus, very fast bus, and it works very well. So, um, again, okay, T take that again uh, in action. For example, Orca Mini, it has Creative Commons by non-commercial. Some are obvious, and some licenses, they have an addendum with the restricted stuff that you are not allowed to do. So don't just read the license, but also click on the link at the bottom where the restricted stuff go. I mean, it sends you to an updated website because sometimes the license on Hugging Face might not be updated for an old model, but the restriction can be updated on the, uh, on the vendor website. Okay, And they will tell you what you can do. So check that. And then you sort it with what your company 
uh, legal crew allow you to do or not. But I would I would say uh, I would stick with a batch license to uh, MIT BSD if possible if you want to do business and you want to be safe. Okay. Other than that, you really need to check. So I hope I give you some interesting stuff here. So for the last last part of this talk, let's speak a bit about tools and solutions. I told you at the beginning that I would give you some hints about how, as tech people, you can actually help uh, your product manager, your DevOps teams, and so on, uh, to do stuff. And I mean, there are really things you can start to try um, to, to be better at legal compliance, including with automation. So there are two ways, I would say, to handle two initiatives that you must take. One is what we call the software bill of material. Who knows what is a software bill of material, the SBOM stuff? A few, only four or five, okay. So what it is, is really the list of entire dependencies. It's a spreadsheet usually. But look again at the Spotify example I gave. This is typically the SBOM, except that Spotify is not listing the proprietary part of the application. But this is exactly that. This is a list of everything you use with the versions, with the repositories, and so on. This is what you must also archive into your private repository so you are sure that you can build again. Remember that? The second thing is that you must have, so no, again, all software we build are made out of open source software and proprietary software. It means that inside your company, you must have an open source initiative. And what you can do is having, a, I would say, a kind of cross-functional team called Open Source Program Office. Usually someone like me who is managing tech knowledge and stuff like that, with someone from legal, with some tech guys who can help to fix stuff, with someone who can write documentation again, think again, I told you at the beginning, you must document that for your developers because they will not figure it out by themselves. So having a kind of cross-functional team like an open source program office will really help you to create an open source policy inside your company and create, I would say, awareness that, yeah, all companies are open source companies. No, I mean, open source is everywhere. You use it. You must acknowledge that, including your executives, and say, okay, we must create rules to use that. Okay. So once you have this SPO stuff, one of the first ta ta tasks to do is generate software bill of material. It's the best practice I recommend. So there's company doing that. Some are very famous in Luxembourg, by the way. Uh, and very expensive sometimes also. But I mean, sometimes it, it's worth surprise to avoid a bad surprise. I like this, it's quite funny. It's worth surprise to avoid a bad surprise, it works. Um, you have, so involve your legal team. Most of the time they don't know about open source. However, most of the time they have skilled people with IP management because they don't manage only your contract side, they also manage the brand, um, all the market stuff. Uh, the domain names and so on. So usually they have, at least if they don't have internally, they have a third party contractor, uh, like a, a lawyer company, something like that, that will have IP management knowledge. And open source is part of IP management, so they will have the base, okay? They can read the license, they can find the resources and the knowledge base about how the license are working, and they will be able to help an OSPO to write the rules. Then document what is acceptable, and particularly document what is forbidden, clearly, okay? And it's not just about the license. I forgot to include that, but I like this XKCD stuff where you have a pile of blocks. And you know, there is this tiny blocks at the bottom written, some guy in Nebraska maintained that for free since 2003. Yeah, this is part of your policy. Maybe you don't want to use a library that is only maintained by one guy doing that on spare time on Saturday when his wife is going outside. Okay, this is, this is not the best practice anyway. And then you can use your continuous integration and your continuous delivery because once you have rules, then hey, you can check the libraries, versions and stuff. You can automate the archival into a private repository. 
Uh, you can uh, create alerts on GitHub or Jira or whatever you use, Bitbucket, sorry, um, to be sure that it's compliant. When you have a new team member, you can also, for example, in companies like Highland, we have a lot of paperwork and compliance stuff to sign regularly. You can ensure that they did some specific training or they signed some specific paper acknowledging that they have responsibilities with third party software that you use, okay, in your company. And on the right column here, you have a few tools. So TERN typically is uh, a software developed to study the dependencies of dependencies of dependencies, so all the layers into Docker images. It's been developed for that. So it, it's on GitHub, uh, it's open source, it's possible to use it for commercial use, and it comes with an impressive documentation and plugins to allow you to put it in your CI. Okay? So I really recommend to, to have a look at that. SPDX, we know what it is, SPDX. That's a tricky one. We use Debian, we know Debian, so Linux distribution. Okay. So if you have seen a deb package, or if you have built a deb package, you have to put a file with some metadata, like the license, using a specific code documented by Debian. And it's becoming a, soft, uh, a standard SPDX with all the license reference, but not just for deb file, but for every software. So you can include this information into the source code of any file of any code. Okay? And it will help turn to find out what is the license of something. Okay? So this is the best practice, and it can be automated. This is easy. Then you have Fossology that comes with a lot of resources online. You can learn a lot from their website and they also know a lot of experts that can help you all around the world uh, with all these problems uh, around legal compliances. Okay. So, um, we are close to the end. Uh, it's small, but it's just because I will share the slide. For those people who are interested, there's a lot of resources that comes with the building of this talk. And when I will share the slides, we have the links okay, to access the details. This is maybe not something you want to read as a developer, but this is something you want to give to your OSPO. Once you will build your open source program office, they will need that. You, this is something you might want to also send to your legal team, okay, so they can archive that in their knowledge base. Okay. And also I have a nice blog, it's not one, but I have a section about open source where I list a lot of interesting resources about open source that can help you also to foster an open source program inside your company with knowledge, with uh, uh, white papers, with ebooks, uh, and so on. So you can build your open source strategy because, I mean, let's face it, every company now is an open source company anyway. Okay. So, there are six, seven minutes uh, left. You can meet me if you have some, I mean, strategy or stuff you want me to ask, but without the public audience know it. You can meet me at the booth later at Highland Booth or at the Mix and Greet. I'm easy to find. I mean, uh, quite a bit fat. I have a black shirt, Highland branded, and so on. So find me. Uh, and excuse, but he, I don't know if this is possible to ask a few questions, but if you have a few question, okay, let's, let's take five, six minutes to answer you. And there's no taboo, so ask everything if I can answer, I know. Uh, yeah, it's okay? Yeah. 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 Th thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to ask in the context of, this is, uh, we're talking about software distribution only in this presentation. No, no, it's software in general. So let's okay. go, ask your question. No, I, ju I just want to ask, I mean, in now with the landscape of the cloud providers, they are- uh, What? the landscape of the cloud providers now, I mean, the multitude of services they offer, and uh, they are also data controllers and data processors. Yes. Do they apply some kind of licensing, like for the software distribution for this uh, Yeah. So when data? you export, so typically you have, so if I understand your question, I have one example in mind, if geography data, you can, so some company provide pre-processed data, and they ship it with like Creative Commons license because you don't have the source, but you can use it, share it, redistribute it, modify it. But like a picture, you will not have the source. So they, they will use a Creative Commons license. 
Typically, like uh, a set of icons will be creative command by share like something like that. And this is what you will find. And you are able to ship by respecting the license. You have to dig for that, but you will find it. Okay. Sometimes, again, it can be non-commercial like LLMs. So you have to pay a license, but so usually it's depending on the amount of use. It can be free for low use and it can be very expensive if you download a lot. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Did it answer your question? Yeah, more or less. Uh, okay, thank you. So thank you for the presentation. Um, at the very beginning, you spoke about uh, okay shipping software. So if I build something with dependencies with that have, for example, GPL and so forth, so on. So I'm working for the CTIE, which is government for the Luxembourg. We don't ship anything. I mean, what we do is that we deploy websites, for mm -hmm. example. And if we use like GPL licenses mm -hmm. in those websites that we build, how does it work in such case? So you don't distribute it. Um, I will. I will try to give you the limit with the example of, so you all have an internet provider at home, so you have a box, okay? In France, there has been a, a case, I mean, a, a complaint by the Free Software Foundation against Free, the internet provider in France, uh, who considered that the box you have at home is part of their network, and so that they are not shipping the box, Okay, because it's still, they still own it and it's the end of their network. And so Free is known to have been used Linux and uh, VLC and for the TV and so on. So everything is in GPL. And so the Free Software Foundation considered at one point that because you had the box at home, it was shipping. But actually Free won the case telling that the box is part of their network and the propriety of the end user start with the Wi-Fi or the Ethernet plug, okay? So as long as it's not exposed outside your organization, it's not shipping. There is one case where if you build a software that is hosted but publicly accessible through network, you must share the sources is with a GPL license, a Ferro GPL, and with the OSL. Uh, it's Look at the OSI, but it's OSL. It's used by PrestaShop and Magento for e-commerce. And those two licenses have a clause called network, uh, remote network access. It means that if you can browse the website, it's a form of distribution and you can request the sources. So that's the only exception, AGPL and OSL, to my knowledge. Again, check with maybe someone with more expertise than me, particularly in your organization, there should be uh, some legal people. Okay? Uh, but yeah, you don't, you're not ship to someone else. It stay inside your organization. Okay. Uh, hello, thank you very much for the presentation. I just have one question here. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier the case of, um, I think it was Nintendo. Yeah, Apple, Nintendo, yeah, uh, Apple using Nintendo BSD using and Visio using GPL. Yeah, I, I was wondering, um, my thinking: If I if I release a product the first time and I use, for instance, um, a BSD or MIT license, um, I think it's I don't remember which one is actually say that you have to publish uh, the first version and afterwards all the updates you're not obliged to disclose them. Which one was it? Oh uh, no, it was not exactly that. I told that with a BSD or MIT license, you can include software into your proprietary software, mm -hmm. and you don't have to share the modification. Like the Spotify application, they have yeah. to tell that they use some library, mm -hmm. but if they modify the library, it's not mandatory to share the modifications. Okay. Ah, okay. This, this is this is what you want to clarify. Yeah, yeah. Because I didn't understand the point, and I was wondering if I ever release a product the first time that I distribute under a certain license, yes. and then I I imagine that okay, I have to do like an update, but I'd like to change. The license oh, I release it under. Is it possible or not? So, if you ha so, for example, a foundation like Eclipse or Linux will sign, will ask contributor to sign a CLA contributor license agreement. This is how, for example, Elastic or Mongo change their license because when an, a third-party contributor contributed code, they had before to sign a contributor license agreement giving all the entire copyright to Elastic and Mongo. So they were able to change the license without asking everybody. 
because although they own the main code, because their employees, I mean, they own the code of their employees. Okay. If you change, so you don't have to change the license from BSD, MISD, and so on dependencies. You don't care. I mean, you care, but it's, it's not something that you want to change. It's, I would say, the container main stuff with your proprietary code. If you want to change that, you must ensure that you have all the authorization from all the people who wrote something. So if this is your colleagues and employees, usually into your contract, there is a paragraph about copyright that is owned by your employer. If there is a subcontractor, usually into the subcontractor contract, okay, service company, consultancy, again, you own. Sometimes not. Okay? Microsoft, that's how they trick IBM with DOS. Because IBM forgot to say, hey, I own DOS. And Microsoft said, let's sell it. Okay? So you must be very strong on the contract side. And if you have uh, some exposed public stuff and some people outside contributed, it's tricky. Let's say the guy is dead. How do you ask him? Let's say he worked for a previous company and his code actually is owned by the company, but the company doesn't want to change the license. You cannot ask the guy. You must ask the legal team of his employer. Okay? Let's say the company disappeared. There's no legal team anymore to say, okay. So you will have to rewrite the parts that are not legal compliant anymore with your new license. So it can be tricky. If it's a small software, it's easy but you don't want to rewrite Linux from scratch. Okay. But typically, I would say, there was a Red Hat stand outside, and uh, this is how Red Hat made money. It's not, I mean, every, anybody can build Linux and make an enterprise distribution with time. But what Red Hat did 20 years ago, and that builds a reputation, is that they ensured that each time they take an open source project and transform it into an enterprise software, it's legal compliant because this is what governments and enterprise buy. They don't care about the technical side. They can hire some guys to, to write stuff. If this is not legal compliant and you have to replace an entire stuff, this is tricky. Okay? And this is what Red Hat is doing. This is what Red Hat has technical guys is to rewrite stuff and ensure that it's compliant. Typically. But they don't do only that, sure. But this is an important part of, the, of their business and their reputation. This is what, why people buy Red Hat. It's, it's for the legal compliance with open source software. Okay. If you have other questions, time is spent, so we must leave. But uh, thank you very much for being there. Thank you very much for your interesting questions. And uh, I'm available at the meet and greet and stand, and we have a Highland booth, so let's meet. <laughs>